This is Ibadi and X, and this is The Candid Frame. The answer to the question of what makes a person an American has been an elusive one. Having a document that states that you are such, either by birth or naturalization, may make it clear legally, but as you likely know, it's always been a much more complicated issue. Though this country prides itself on being founded and grown and sustained by its immigrants, it has sometimes been those very differences of race, culture, religion, politics, and ethnicity that have made it so difficult to find an all-embracing definition of what it is to be an American, if that's even possible. That's a question that photographer An Rung Zhu has pursued in his work documenting the lives of Chinese Americans. His images illustrate the challenges faced by people of Chinese heritage who, like many other immigrants, have often been asked to abandon their culture and history as a way of proving their loyalty to their new country. It's something that An Rong had to face as a young immigrant boy in elementary school. From fourth grade until eighth grade, I had a huge identity crisis. I wanted to be white, essentially. Like, I started listening to music that I didn't like. I started listening to, like, you know, no offense to, like, people who like rock music, but, like, I w- all the white kids were into, like, rock and punk music, and I, I fell into it. I was like, yeah, I'm totally about this. Like, I'm, I'm about all this shit about Satan and stuff, and I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, you know? So, like, these kids kind of pushed me into this realm where self-hate, was because I didn't see myself reflected in anything else. So I kind of went after the things that I thought had the most social value. Anne Rong has dedicated many years to this ongoing project. And as a result, it has evolved and changed over time. It's expanded beyond the small community of New York's Chinatown to elsewhere in the country. What's also changed is how and why he's created his photographs. From that moment on, I just started shooting color. And that's when this kind of flavor of the neighborhood started coming out in my photos. And like these things about like Chinatown that is so much about the color, like the color red, the color that we like kind of tie ourselves to as as Chinese people with Chinese heritage. Red is our color. And so um, the all these plays on color and all these plays on like the way we dress started really factoring into like my photographs and things that I was interested in. So it started off as this idea of me chasing my teenage years that I lost to becoming this idea of, well, this is me really just traveling through a reflection of my experience through Chinese America and my views on how we have built out our communities and how we are trying to persevere in this country. And so that was kind of the building blocks of the project. We'll talk to Ayn Rong about what he has discovered about the history of Chinese Americans as he's traveled the country and how his time documenting the final years of his grandfather helped him to become a documentary photographer. And later, I'll share about a time when I thought I would give up photography, but didn't. Welcome to The Candid Frame. I'm wrong. Welcome to The Candid Frame. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, when I got turned on to your work, I was very excited about what I was seeing and the story behind it. So we got a lot, lot to talk about. <laughs> uh, but I want to get back to your, literally your beginnings. You, know, you immigrated mm-hmm. to the United States when you were just two years old from China. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've heard you sort of talk about was the way that you found yourself being treated as a result of being an immigrant at a young age resulted in you wanting to sort of push back from that sort of Chinese identity. And I want to talk about what that was like for you. How were you being treated, you know, when you when you came here that resulted in you wanting to distance yourself from that part of yourself? So I came to America when I was two years old, but Immediately, I actually lived in Chinatown in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I grew up for a while not actually knowing anything outside of Chinatown. So in that respect, I was immersed in this microcosm of China. 
but more so Southern China. Okay. In this little microcosm, I the only white people or non-Chinese people that I saw were the custodians at school and the teachers at school and the people on the television. And it wasn't until I moved to Queens when I was eight that I actually started facing a lot of um, discrimination, I guess would be the easiest way to say it, uh, discrimination and racism towards me by my fellow classmates. And this is this is fourth grade. And uh, these kids are, I don't know what it is, but like children have a really powerful way to be the most rude people in the room and also be the most <laughs> honest people in the room. Yeah. <laughs> so when I first moved to Queens, I, I started making friends that weren't, that weren't uh, Chinese for the most part. I was making friends with the black kids, the Hispanic kids, the white kids, and the Chinese kids and the uh, Korean kids. So like these were really international. But my, I remember my first friend was this black kid named Warney. We were getting along, but then at some point, the cool kids wanted to like kind of spend a little more time with me and so, like started making me distance myself from Warney because they somehow convinced me that he was of less social value mm. than than them. So uh, being a kid, that's what you kind of lean towards. You want to be accepted. You want to feel like you are part of something. And so that that was the beginning of me kind of falling into this rabbit hole of like a confused identity yeah. in that like I wasn't allowed to kind of be who I was or like accept myself for being a person of color in America. And more importantly, my Chinese heritage started taking a back burner because I was told by my fellow white classmates that, oh, your entire identity is consumed into the word Asian and we're going to just make fun of you for eating with chopsticks. We're going to make fun of you for eating foods that aren't hamburgers or we're going to make fun of you for eating things that aren't considered traditionally Western food. Mm -hmm. One of my first interactions when I made one of my first white friends, this guy named Andrew, I go over to his house and he has like an older brother who's a teenager at the time. And his first question to me goes, oh, I don't know, you're, you're Asian, uh, you're Chinese, right? I heard you guys have small dicks. Is this true? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fucking eight years old. Like, I'm eight years old. How is that, like, an appropriate question for anyone? Like, who opens up a conversation like that? And, like, that created a snowball effect on me questioning my identity, questioning who I was, mm -hmm. questioning if I was born the right race. And then, like, from there, I despised everything about my Chinese heritage. Like, I didn't like being a about this whole idea of, oh, we speak a different language. We, we eat different things. And we are subjected to being, like, essentially second-class citizens because of some made-up social hierarchy. And so from fourth grade until eighth grade, I had a huge identity crisis. I... I wanted to be white, essentially. Like mm -hmm. I started listening to music that I didn't like. I I was forced. <laughs> to, I started listening to like, well, you know, no offense to like people who like rock music, but like I all the white kids were into like rock and punk music, and I fell into it. I was like, yeah, I'm totally about this. Like mm -hmm. I'm I'm about all this shit about Satan and stuff, and I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, you know. So like these kids kind of pushed me into this realm where self hate was because I didn't see myself reflected in anything else. So I kind of went after the things that I thought had the most social value. Did you see that choice that you were making being reflected in some of the other kids of Chinese heritage that are around you? Um, I think I particularly fell into the, the white rabbit hole a little more than the other Asian kids. Mm -hmm. I think because I was uh, new to the school, a lot of the Asian kids already had friends within their own kind of insular community. And so I was a new kid and it was a little harder to make friends that way. Did, did you, did you find that other Chinese kids who had been around for longer, that, that there was a sort of hierarchy as compared to someone who was from, from uh, mainland China or Hong Kong or wherever they were uh, for a lesser time? I don't, I don't think there was any hierarchy in regards to like which Asian you were. Mm -hmm. But I think it was just the fact that I didn't grow up with them for a, a good portion of their lives that they didn't see that. I, like, especially in elementary school, they didn't feel like I was belonged. I was the new kid again, yeah. you know? So when did that start, start changing for you? 
Uh, it started changing in high school, which uh, happenedly because I started playing football and most of my teammates were black and Hispanic and, and like that kind of changed my perspective on who I was and perspective on being more accepting of my own cultural heritage because all my black teammates didn't care that I was Asian. They didn't care that I was, uh, I, I looked different from them. We were all working towards the same goal. And a lot of them were just, we, we didn't even talk about race when it came to it. Like we kind of just talked about football and in this sense, like, they made it, me feel like it was okay to be who I was. And, you know, I could be weird. I could enjoy my food. And, like, I don't have to, like, be subjected to this idea of a stereotype. And just the fact that you have that camaraderie that comes from what sports provide, mm -hmm. you know, provide a sort of a brotherhood, just like, you know, people who are soldiers, that the things yes. that normally would make them different all of a sudden don't, don't, don't matter because you have that shared passion, that same goal you know, or that shared goal. Yeah. It, it's, an, it, it's a, like one of the great things about like when you're working together in a group is that you all share the same misery and you also share the same successes. Mm -hmm. So when you actually share that with people, it creates a bigger bond than anything that's really superficial. You know, you have that body of work that you uh, did of your grandfather mm -hmm. after he was diagnosed with, with cancer. Mm -hmm. And I read the letter that you had posted on your site, which was really moving. I'm really glad that you included that as part of the, the series of images that you have there. Talk to me about, you know, that, that body of work, why you did it, and how it allowed you to sort of connect to, you know, that part of you that you had sort of repressed for, for a good part of your childhood? So the project on my grandfather began, began uh, my second year of college. And uh, at this time, we were encouraged to kind of pursue a project to follow for an entire year. And uh, at the time, my grandfather got diagnosed with throat cancer. And for me, I took it upon myself to just spend as much time as I could with him because I didn't know how much longer he was going to have. He was, mm -hmm. he, he was going to refuse treatment and we were just going to play the, like play time. And so I went with the purpose of just spending time with him, but I started gravitating towards photographing him and it became this kind of journey between him and I to kind of understand each other more because my grandfather raised me when I was living in Chinatown. And so he was kind of like my first, big male figure in my life who showed me, showed me the ropes, showed me how to get around Chinatown, showed me how to talk to people, showed me how to like deal with individuals and groups. And, you know, on Saturday, he used to take me to the park and leave me at the park all day and just let me play while he was gambling over on the other side of the park, mm -hmm. playing chess with the old folks. So part of who I am in my early years is tied to who my grandfather is. In this sense, I had, I kind of took it upon myself to find out more about who he was because I didn't really, I realized I didn't know anything about him other than he was my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so in this time, I spent a lot of time like tagging along with him to his little adventures or going to the doctor or like just sitting at home and watching him read the newspaper, drink his juice box or like just sleep. And in this, uh, in the four years that I worked on the project, it was kind of me learning more about my cultural self and just observing my grandfather, observing him, looking at the books he was reading, looking at the newspaper articles he was reading, and also the TV shows he was watching, mm -hmm. as well as me asking him questions. Part of what we do as photographers or documentary photographers is we start off with a question and then we go deeper into try to understanding what the answer is, because sometimes their initial answer isn't really the answer that we're looking for. Mm. And so with my grandfather, I had the simple question of like, who are you? And that turned into this huge question of, well, how did you get here in 87 if you had like five brothers and sisters who two of them are already in America? And that kind of built into all these questions about my grandfather and his identity and his history. And so that project was this, it's like in that movie, The Matrix, when Morpheus unplugs Neo and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the, the real world is showing itself to you. Yeah. Like my gr working on that project with my grandfather became that moment where like 
whoa, I'm no longer believing the story that like my parents have told me for all my life or like believing the story that I thought I knew. Now it's a brand um, new story that I had no idea what's yeah, going on. The family myths, man, that is, I've had my share of surprises finding out some <laughs> stuff about my parents and, you know, things that I had never would have imagined. And then just, it slips and all of a sudden it just changes everything. What were some of the surprises? What were the things that you didn't expect to learn um, about your grandfathers from the time that you spent with them? Well, I was like, uh, one of my questions was, how many brothers and sisters do you have? I never knew how many brothers and sisters he had. I didn't even know he had brothers or sisters. And he was one of six kids from my understanding and from my like research. Mm. And he was the last one. And he was the, he, he had spent most of his life uh, in China as the local fundraiser slash accountant for our family village. And so he had deep ties to the overseas Chinese in America who were sending money back and he'd help raise the money to like fix the town, fix like buildings, things, uh, things of that nature. And so with that, I, it started unraveling, like who, who are your other brothers and sisters? Like, I want to know who they are. Mm -hmm. And then like finding out that my grandfather had been smoking his entire life, which was a complete surprise to me. Like the more time I spent with him, like when I was a kid, he, he like, I never saw him smoke. And then I started, as I got older, I started realizing as I was doing this project, I started realizing, I was like, Oh, this dude smokes like at least half a pack a day. Like, like he's like going out. Uh, like when he used to have to go out, it was mm -hmm. actually going out to take his smoke. And like, I was like, okay, now it's giving me an idea of like why he has throat cancer, okay. <laughs> possibly. And then like it, uh, realizing that he, you know, he was still a, a man. Um, once I walked in on him reading a Playboy magazine from like the eighties and I was like, I was like, all right, horny as ever, still an old man. <laughs> like, like you can't, you can't get rid of the dog in you. Right. <laughs> so, so, so like, I was just all like, all right. Uh, I thought you were this like well-mannered school, school gentleman that like you've always poised yourself as and like other things like finding out that my grandmother also was, um, they got married in the midst, like right before world war II started breaking out and the Japanese occupation of China. And so like all those little things culminated into more questions about my family. And like, um, I think probably the biggest surprise that I got from my grandfather was just that like, we have been in America since the 1800s. Like my, my great grandfather, my grandfather's father, he is buried in, in Queens in New York. And I found out that from, uh, from that, he, he probably had a whole nother lineage that like preceded him to bring him to America. Mm. So like there's, so that is, has caused me to research more about like my family history through national archives and national records of what we, how we came to America. From creating these images of your grandfather, mm -hmm. you were doing more than just, you know, making individual photographs you were creating a, a body of work a narrative mm -hmm. and as you said you started this in school and you worked on it for four years what did you learn about working on a project like this that was that's become important to you in your work as a you know as a documentary photographer and a photojournalist starting a project is always hard and you have to put yourself into it and you have to fully dive into it and just keep making work. But there's points where you start making the same photograph over and over again. Yeah. And that's when it becomes really hard as a photographer because you're constantly fighting yourself to make one image better than the next. Mm -hmm. And this is where this project really took me was that I learned how to make another image, trying to communicate the same thing, but in a different way. And learning how to create this dissonance between myself and my grandfather and kind of weave this story like nowadays, photography isn't so much about tell, like sometimes it's not really about telling a story anymore, like creating this bigger idea, bigger than yourself. It's kind of turned into a relationship between the photographer and the subjects that they photograph and this creation of the narrative between the two. 
And so I think for me, that's where I kind of have learned to build myself and where I make my work and work that matters to me yeah. is that like for me, m- me photographing my grandfather is as much about him as it is a- as much about me. Yeah. Considering how personal this was, did you face any sort of pushback from other family members or <laughs> and or did you limit yourself because you were concerned about how your family members might perceive certain photographs? The letter that you read in, uh, on my website to my grandfather, that actually was uh, translated into Chinese, and I wrote it for my grandfather. Uh, I had a friend, my friend Judy, she translated it for me. And when my grandfather read it, he just gave me the approving nod to say, hey, go ahead. Like, it was basically me asking him, hey, I'm just photographing you, and like, I hope you're okay with it. Mm-hmm. And he, he gave me the nod. Nobody asked questions. I think my parents were really happy that I was spending time with him. And I think uh, other family members were happy that they didn't have to chase after my grandfather. Because, <laughs> because, because <laughs> honestly, this man w- it w- was in his 90s, but like he was the hardest person to find sometimes. Like he would disappear into the Mahjong halls in Chinatown and not emerge for at least 13 hours sometimes. Oh my and God. I'd be all like, how do you have the energy to sit there and play Mahjong for like 12 hours of the day? That's amazing. He, he's like a, a little bit of a mystery at times. But um, I did face criticism from family members after, uh, after my grandfather passed and this became a exhibit. Mm-hmm. My great uncle, who is my grandmother's brother, he saw the work and he objected to it. He objected to me showing my grandfather in vulnerable states, he objected to show my grandfather um, in a in a position where he wasn't looking his best. Mm-hmm. And I think his objection to it was he's just very conservative in a sense that he didn't feel like revealing family secrets or family issues is important. But I but I think it's through art and through the work that we do as artists and photographers is that we are able to share very hyper-focused ideas that are universally relatable. My story for my, of my grandfather means my grandfather to me and our relationship, but somebody else looking at it has a totally different interpretation. Yeah. And what they feel and what they see is another story. And like, if I can get somebody to think about their family or their relationship with their grandfather or their grandparents through my photographs, I'm more than happy with that result. That makes me feel great because I'm creating a conversation within yourself about what your life is because I think that's where good art lies. It's this ability to take you from point A to like point D without ever having to leave the room. So tell me about the the germ that began your Chinese-American work. At one point, I I started realizing that my grandfather wasn't going to tell me any more about my Chinese American history because he, one, he was limited because he had the tumor in his throat. But two, most of my, like my father, my uncles, they didn't really know much or weren't telling me much. So I went to the next person who would know, which was my great uncle John, uh, who lived in Quincy, Massachusetts. And that's my grandmother's brother. And so when I went to him, I kind of asked him questions about his family history and like w- the journey that it took for him to get to America. And that started this whole quest of like, well, what it does it mean to be Chinese American? Why are we constantly ignored as an American people? Why is the conversation about America usually only black and white? Why don't we have this understanding that there are other people in America other than the ones that the news always says? So for me, I took the questions that my grandfather could answer and started going after other people and trying to find those answers. And eventually the Chinese, like my Chinese Americans work, uh, which I I call my Americans, that kind of became a, like a project of me exploring the Chinese American identity through images of everyday life in America, in America, but through a Chinese lens and through the Chinese American people, Mm -hmm. because our story is very similar to every other generation who's been here. And our story is similar to all those people who came before us or came with us 
on trying to succeed in America and build a better life for themselves. And that's like where, so this little question of, well, what else is there to the story? And like, why aren't you telling me what I want to know became this bigger idea that I tried to like build out over the past seven, eight years. And what were, how, how did you pursue those, those initial images? I mean, what were you, you know, going out and asking people to photograph? Did you just roam the streets? Exactly. Mm-hmm. What did that look like initially? So um, my junior year in college, I started working on this and um, I was interested in spending time in Chinatown and photographing it because I felt like in New York City. And the the thing was the gentrification was happening. Things are changing in the neighborhood. So I, I took it upon myself to photograph it. I thought that was my responsibility as a Chinatown native, as a person who has like family ties to this place. But as I started photographing it, I started realizing that the work isn't about Chinatown uh, per se, but it was about my experiences and my reflections on my Chinese American life. Mm-hmm. So I spent a lot of time at the handball courts in China, uh, in Chinatown. Uh, okay. And when I was at the handball courts, all I was really seeing was like teenagers playing handball, teenagers hanging out after school, teenagers cut the teenagers cutting school. And for me, like, I kind of like felt like I was reliving my teenage years that I missed out in high school because I spent most of high school playing football. So my years removed from that, like Chinese American experience as a teenager for like, I was definitely afraid of like trying to photograph these kids because they're all like cool looking. They all look like they're a little dangerous. They all smoke and they're all like chilling with their girlfriends and boyfriends. And they all look like they can beat me up really quick. Mm -hmm. So like for me, it was intimidating to like go up to them. And one thing that I've learned as I've started working as a photographer and as an artist is whatever scares the shit out of you is probably something that's worth exploring. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I went after it. I, I started talking to these kids. I started photographing them and it started off as a black and white project actually. Uh, because I was still kind of uh, moving from my grandfather into this project and one day, uh, as I was showing it in class, uh, one of my, well, this was one of my most memorable moments in college. Uh, my teacher, Carlos Moda, he says to me, he's like, well, you're making work about people of color. Why the hell are you shooting in black and white? <laughs> 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 and so from that moment on, I just started shooting color. And that's when this kind of flavor of the neighborhood started coming out in my photos and like Mm -hmm. these things about like Chinatown that is so much about the color, like the color red, the color that we like kind of tie ourselves to as, as Chinese people with Chinese heritage, red is our color. And so, um, the, all these plays on color and all these plays on like the way we dress started really factoring into like my photographs and things that I was interested in. So it started off as, this idea of me chasing my teenage years that I lost Mm -hmm. to becoming this idea of, well, this is me really just traveling through a reflection of my experience through Chinese America and my views on how we have built out our communities and how we are trying to persevere in this country. And so that was kind of the building blocks of the project. The other night, my wife and I had the pleasure of having dinner with several friends, one of which included the photographer Sam Abel. Not only has Sam been a guest on the show, but he's easily one of the best and most influential photographers of his generation. He has inspired countless photographers with his images, books, lectures, and workshops. He is not only a great photographer, but also a true and generous soul who I am lucky enough to call a friend. As I sat there with him, I felt like I had to pinch myself because here I was, sitting with a man whose work I used to obsess on when I first became a photographer. 
I can't count the number of times I looked at his images in the pages of National Geographic trying to absorb every bit of wisdom I could. And when he told me at the end of the evening how much he appreciated the work that I do with the candid frame and that he's always sharing it with his students and peers, I was deeply moved. To have someone who I so respect tell me how much he values what I do is beyond humbling. But I get the pleasure of such support every week when I see the thousands of downloads for the show, the emails, the text messages, the donations, and people approaching me on the street to tell me how much the show means to them. As hard as it can be sometimes to get a show out, I always remember that you're out there waiting for that next episode. Your help has, in so many ways, sustained me over the past 13 years and 456 episodes. So when I ask you to become a Patreon supporter and to help us financially, I know I'm asking this not just for me. You make this possible for the thousands of people all over the world for whom photography is as necessary as air and water. And believe it or not, that $5 or more a month that you give holds even more value because it lets me know that there is another person out there that really has faith in what we're doing. So become a Patreon supporter and commit to a reoccurring donation of $5 or more a month. We are less than 20 people away from our goal. Come and join us. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame or click on the link in the show notes or the Candor Frame website. Thanks. In, in Chinatown, especially, I mean, just anywhere in sort of in New York that is, any neighborhood in New York that's populated by an ethnic group, whether it's Chinese, whether it's Dominicans, whether it's Puerto Ricans, what's really fascinating is that you get to see... Um, Multiple, multi generational layers, right? Of people that are sort of occupying the same space. You don't mm-hmm. see that in LA. I mean, it, <laughs> it, may, it may be there somewhere, but it's you know, because everyone lives in their in their cars. But you see how the, the young young kids, and then the older ones, and everyone sort of in between, or you know, eating at the restaurants, going to the markets, hanging out at the at the curb, and I think that. That mashup, not even including all the people who like move through Chinatown who are not of that ethnicity and that race. And I think that seeing that multi generational thing is really a fascinating part of what it is to be part of a, of any sort of community. In terms of you photographing that range, what was the challenge for you as a photographer to to illustrate that? that that is part of what this community is and looks like? I think the biggest challenge of trying to show multi-generational kind of gaps was knowing how to navigate each. So, mm-hmm. like, I have to, like, um, I, I need to know how to speak to the seniors while also knowing how to speak to the, the teenagers. And this ability to talk to them is really important because this is sometimes how you break into things first. There's no easy way about it. And I think with, uh, with like the older generation, I've always had to come off uh, like speaking to them in a very respectful manner, letting them know that uh, if I ask to photograph them, uh, w- which in most cases I don't really ask, I just kind of go and shoot it. Mm-hmm. But when I do ask, I do try to create a dialogue of uh, being polite and being, uh, being a good person. Because like the worst thing somebody can say is no, right? Yeah. But with the younger generation, I've had confrontations where people don't want me to photograph them. And when that happens, for the most part, I just shake it off and move on. If they don't want me to photograph them, they don't want me to photograph them. I try to be respectful of people's personal space. Uh, sometimes it's just things I see on the street and I just photograph it. But I've had experiences where like people invite me in and then before I shoot, I ask. And I think it's just knowing what you're going after sometimes. So like there's days where I'll spend it on the older side of the neighborhood versus on the newer side of the neighborhood, Mm -hmm. just to kind of see the difference a little bit. 
But I think since, like you said, we kind of live on top of each other, we all kind of just are existing and coexisting within the same space. So sometimes it's not even intentional. It's just there. Right. And, uh, well, and also within Chinese culture, I think we have so much integration between the old and the young because there's the whole built in filial piety within Chinese culture of spending time with your elders and caring for them. So I think there's a lot within the Chinese culture that brings us together always. You know, the population of, of, of Chinese is not just relegated to the coast. It's not just San Francisco and New York and major cities. I mean, just like any immigrant, they're everywhere. They're in the middle of Omaha, Nebraska. They're in, you know, there's some small town in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, as you've had the chance to sort of explore other areas than the area that you've grown up, what have been some of the fascinating things that you've discovered as a result of this project? So um, Jennifer Eight Lee once said, there are more Chinese restaurants in America than McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King combined. <laughs> you go to any small town in America, there's always going to be one Chinese restaurant. Hmm. Uh, one thing that I realized while, so the most remote place I've been to with a Chinese restaurant was Jerome, Idaho, which is a 20 minute drive from Twin Falls, Idaho, which is a two slash three hour drive from Boise, which is probably the only place that you've really heard of in Idaho. Uh, so like my uncle actually owned a restaurant out there. And I went out there to photograph him and his family and just like capture this sense of a small town Americana Chinese restaurant. And in a sense, his restaurant was kind of like a diner for the locals there. Mm -hmm. And like the, the locals would go there, sit and drink their coffee and they would order their patty melt with like fried rice on the side. So I think... It, if anything that I've learned from going to the, like small towns and like going to these like Midwest cities with uh, with Chinese Americans is that Chinese people are really resilient in any situation that they're given. They're willing to sacrifice anything for their family for the most part. Like a lot of these restaurant owners who open up their restaurants in the middle of nowhere uh, serving little towns is because they know that they need to work hard in order to give a better life to their generation before them. Mm-hmm. I mean, gener- for the generation after them. And for them, their their next generation is what they work for. And a lot of that is driven by love. And this love for you, their family, this love for their kids. It's like this need to succeed because they're putting all their, all like they're going all in to make sure that somebody else is taken care of rather than pursuing their own dreams of whatever they want to be. They're doing it so that they can sacrifice and be, give better opportunities that they can't be afforded. So it's like, I think in a sense, it's like this capacity of love that I don't think many people realize as love. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've taken away is that, Chinese folks are full of love and full of willingness to give their all for their families. And, you know, regionally speaking, there's a lot of, there's, there's differences. Cause like on the West coast, there's, um, there's a lot of like older generations of Chinese Americans. So for those folks, it's a lot more, uh, Americanized in a way. In like, like the first time I went to San Francisco, I, I remember going into, um, this restaurant called Capital, which is famous for their chicken wings. And I sat down and I ordered a minced pork salted fish uh, over rice dish, which is a classic Taishanese dish. And that's where my family's from in Taishan in China. And so um, the Taishanese were the first people to come to America uh, or to start building out their uh, their homes here. Um, So for me, when I ordered that dish, I ordered Chinese because I heard the waitress speaking in Chinese. And then I see this older gentleman who is like, he looks like a grandpa. He has a beard. He has old white whiskers. And then I hear him speak in perfect English, like asking for his check and then talking to the waitress for a little bit in perfect English. And my mind was just blown because I've never seen a, a Chinese American adult speak perfect English 
<laughs> that looked like him. And like that kind of went to show that like I was really ignorant of what was out there for Chinese Americans, you know? And so from there, like I just realized that the generations run deep on the West Coast yeah. as opposed to us on the East Coast where we might have a few generations in, but for the most part, a lot of us are newer immigrants. And that's, you know, that's something I wanted to ask you about because, you know, the, there was a huge population of Chinese during the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the, the gold rush and then with the building of the railroad. And then, you know, at some point, you know, the U.S. government said, okay, no more. We don't want any more Chinese coming into the country. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar, anybody? Um, so th that part of the history, and it, because like you said, it wasn't so much a big part of maybe what it was for the East Coast, but that sort of, you know, that part of the story for some people who have lived here for, you know, generations, how did this project allow you to learn more about that part of the collective history of Chinese Americans. When you work on anything, you have to become well-versed in it. You have to know as much as you can about the history of what you're focusing on, uh, about as much of the new developments that are going on. So for me, I took it upon myself to understand the waves of immigration within the Chinese American people and to understand how, how it worked and how, where, how we got to where we are. Because, you know, for situations like this where somebody asked me how, <laughs> about the different generationals, uh, the different generations, I think a big part of it is seeing how one generation kind of was kind of forced to be small. They were forced to not really be recognized as, as people or not, not be allowed the rights that other Americans were afforded. Mm -hmm. And then... There's the quote unquote bamboo ceiling that a lot also face. But then we have, we're in a different time now. We're in a time where people, there's more recognition of Asian Americans. There's a lot more recognition of Chinese Americans and their accomplishments. And I think in part, it's due to the fact that people are becoming more vocal. People are willing to hear more voices and people are willing to share their story. And I think that's the, the, that's the big thing. In the past, people, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, because of that act, we were forced to kind of go into hiding. You were kind of forced to hide your family story. You were forced to not acknowledge who you really are because we had a whole string of what they called paper sons, people who bought their identities and had to become totally different people in order to get to America mm. so that they could get a better opportunity in life. And like these paper sons gave up who they were in the past to be, assume a new identity. They could have been a Wong, but they, when they came to America, they were a Chen because they bought papers from a guy named Chen. Wow. In this whole, whole scheme, we have all these different waves of immigration. Like in the 80s and 90s, we had a huge uh, group of people who were smuggled to America, like illegally smuggled to America. And that was in part because they wanted the American dream. They wanted to like go after like the golden venture, the, the ship that crashed in the Rockaways in New York city, like this group of, uh, of, of like immigrants from China who were just trying to afford a better life, all getting brought in on like a boat that crashed. And then they were all sent back and like, then they wanted to come back again for some reason. Wow. And so like understanding these different waves helps me know it informs me of the emotion of what I want to go after in my photographs. And it informs me about my decisions on who I want to photograph. And like, like for example, learning more, like that one statistic about there being more Chinese restaurants in America than those three fast food chains combined, mm -hmm. that blew my mind. And it put into this perspective that for Chinese people, our food is our livelihood. Our food is our love. Our food is what we give the world. And what we want in exchange is just an ability to live our dreams and our ability to pursue this like land of liberty and land of freedom, you know? Yeah. You know, part of any member of this country is visual documentation of their existence in terms of the history. And for a large part, Chinese, Native Americans, to some extent, 
blacks and Hispanics have sort of been re relegated to the periphery or completely left out of the frame. And I'm wondering that in your research, did you discover any sort of body of work that was created of you know, basically the same communities that you were exploring that were being done by another Asian American or were, or were, or were the images that you found other people documenting those communities? One of the important things about photography is you don't become a good photographer overnight. You might make a good picture here or there, but if you don't study the history before you, you're bound to make the same mistakes or make the same photograph somebody else did. Right. So for me, I tried to look up people who have done work about Chinese Americans or Asian Americans or any ethnic community. And one person who really brought me into understanding the Asian American community is this guy, Corky Lee. He uh, is the quote unquote undisputed unofficial Asian American photo laureate. And he's been photographing Asian American activism since the 1970s, I believe. And so I learned a lot about Asian American history from him and the Chinese American history from him. So that was an important factor into how I approached my work about where I would go, about who I would uh, approach about photographing. Um, but then there's uh, other people like Wing Young Huey, who's a photographer out in Minnesota. He f did his own trip through uh, America and photographed things that, excuse me, uh, Wing Young Huey photographed a lot of things that reminded him of his Asian America, his views on what uh, America is through his lens. And then there, uh, there's also Thomas Holton, who did a whole project on, on one family he followed for like over 10 years. Like Tom Holton embedded himself with his family and became sort of like a family member and photographed this one family and captures this kind of immigrant story through, through like a long period of time that I really looked up to when I was, first began this project. So these three photographers were really influential in how I started looking at Asian America and how I started kind of the beginning of the projects. Um, I, you know, obviously I also looked at how Robert Frank shot America. Uh, Robert Frank was a huge influence on me for, or, or any documentary photographer, any, really speaking. Robert Frank's The Americans was kind of the basis of this idea that we could show America through photographs and show the tensions between different races and show the tension of like this older generation, this new generation. And I think we're all kind of trying to tell the same story in a sense, but trying to have different characters. And like, there was this one photograph in the Americans um, that I thought was really like, really it hit, hit me. It was a uh, Robert Frank photograph, this one cemetery in San Francisco. It's a Chinese cemetery. Mm -hmm. The, at this point when he was photographing it, it, it was in the fifties, I believe. And like at this point, Chinese have been in America for close to a hundred years or over a hundred years at this point in this entire book, 83 photographs. This is the one image that represents Chinese people in America. And it is an image that simply is of a cemetery. It shows that we ourselves, it, it's kind of, I don't think he knew he was doing this, but for me, this is how I interpreted it. It kind of showed that the Chinese American people were kind of quietly dying away and quietly pushed down to the ground in this, in this country at that moment. Nobody was speaking up. We were relegated to just being unknowns. We were relegated to being foreigners. We were relegated to only having our own claim once we were put into the ground. Speaking of that, there's a scene that I came upon when I was in college. I was mm. driving up to Eureka, California from Berkeley. Mm. And we're going down this road. And in the middle of the road, basically a median, were grave mm. markers. And I think mm. they were Chinese grave markers. And it was like, it was just so odd that mm. there wasn't a cemetery on either side. It was just like, this was a gr grave right here in this median. And for whatever reason... They didn't disinter those bodies. They just sort of built around it. Mm -hmm. and it was always just that was just sort of a, a really odd and sort of fascinating thing that I I wish I'd made a photograph of it. It was still <laughs> 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 photograph not taken. Yeah, um, no. 
<laughs> a lot of those graves are of a lot of of that first second generation of like Asian of Chinese Americans who came to America. A lot of them, like for instance, uh, there's this town called Locke, Locke, California. It was one of the first Chinese American settlements in America. It was like a town full of just Chinese people, and a lot of them they have their graves nearby, and it's because. It's not that we choose to be amongst each other. It's we were forced to be amongst each other right. because no, because no one else like like the, the majority race refused to let us within their homes or within their neighborhoods. So we had to make our own place, and we built it ourselves. And so it's crazy, but like yeah, there's small little towns and like settlements of Chinese Americans throughout like Northern California, just like the ones you just described. Yeah, in Los Angeles, where the um, main train station is located, mm -hmm. uh, that used to be the location of old Chinatown, not mm -hmm. where the current one was in here. And I was reading that when they moved all the Chinese out of there, mm -hmm. they discovered this network of tunnels <laughs> underneath, <laughs> underneath it, which mm -hmm. was used for a variety of reasons, and not least of which was probably safety. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and uh, just 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 fascinating. You know, the, the sort of the stories, they get lost, yeah. you know. I think when you're pushed into this position in life where you either have to survive or die, you figure out how to survive, right? It's, it's the whole fight or flight. And I think um, Chinese Americans, when they came here, they knew that life wasn't going to be easy. They knew life wasn't going to be this simple, come here and find gold. And it's kind of like that idea we aren't it's not going to be an easy life but if you do well you'll be able to provide for a better life for your next generation yeah. so how has all this work that you've created that was personal uh helped you in terms of creating a career for yourself as a photographer i think when i started the chinese americans work uh that kind of was just really my motivation to make photographs uh i don't think anybody gets hired for well, if they don't have personal work, mm -hmm. if they don't have work that they can really show that they are interested in or pursuing in. And I think um, one of my first like uh, moments where people started looking at my work more was when Jeffrey Henson Scales over at the New York Times um, put my work in the Sunday Review. And he put my, the My Americans work into the Sunday Review and put me on a platform where I could show people this work. And then like I started showing that work more and then I, work started coming in and then they started seeing that I could pursue projects and also pursue stories, but also be able to come back with images. And so I think slowly over time, I learned how to be a better editorial photographer. I, I don't think I was that great when I first started, but mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm slowly getting better. <laughs> so what's, what's the key difference between how you were shooting for this personal work and shooting editorially? I don't think there's a huge difference. I think the big difference for me is just the pursuit of a story. Within, within my personal work, I like to kind of just float around. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I linger. I, I will sit at a table in a restaurant for 15 minutes watching the light just because I think the light, I hope the light hits the waiter at this one specific angle yeah. and I can capture that image. As opposed to when I'm working on deadline, I'm like, okay, I have to be out of here in 10 minutes. I don't have time to wait five <laughs> minutes. I'm just going to get more in your face and try to make this photo happen. Okay. You know? So like, I think uh, the sense of urgency is different when I'm working uh, personally and when I'm working uh, editorially. Oh, that's a good distinction to know. <laughs> well, my last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? I think my favorite photographers out there right now is this guy named uh, Park Sung Jin. And um, Sung Jin is a Korean photographer based in Seoul, and he's been working on some projects in Thailand, but he has this one project called Kid Nostalgia. And uh, Sung is a good friend of mine, but something about his work, man. Like, it takes you to another place in time. He shot this entire series of teenagers in, in Seoul from the 
late 90s to the early 2000s where all these kids weren't like the exceptionally smart kids in class. These were the kids who were cutting school. Mm-hmm. These were the kids who were sneaking around, uh, not up, up to no good. And he captures these portraits of these kids in this limbo of maturity and in this limbo of life. And so I, when I look at his project and look at his work, it stirs up so much within me because it feels like another life that I could have lived. Ooh. Yeah, I look forward to, to checking out his work. Yeah. Well, and wrong. Thank you so much, man, for making time for me. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. If anything was incoherent, let me know. We can do it again. <laughs> for a segment in the show where I share thoughts, ideas, and memories that may or may not involve photography. We call it the last frame. I used to think that discomfort was something that was best avoided. Feeling discomfort meant the possibility of failure, humiliation, and rejection. Who wants that? I certainly didn't. So I figured that if I avoided discomfort... I wouldn't have to face those things. Life, however, is rarely so clean and simple. Avoiding discomfort brought its own set of complications, which included saying no to things I should have said yes to. Avoiding discomfort meant expending huge amounts of energy, trying to maintain the status quo, even though the status quo was not working for me anymore. Avoiding discomfort meant avoiding risk, That came at the price of growth and the unexpected benefits of breakthroughs. It was that kind of stagnation that resulted in my putting my camera equipment away for a year when I was working back at Nikon. I thought that I was leaving photography behind. I looked at my pictures and I just... I just seemed to be making the same photographs over and over again. I was frustrated by my lack of progress. I certainly wasn't seeing my work resembling the work of the photographers that I so admired. I had access to some of the best equipment at Nikon. I could use any camera, any lens, and all my film and processing was paid for. My duties demanded that I be familiar with how all this gear worked, and they encouraged us to go out there and shoot with it, which I did. But when I looked at the photographs, I wasn't happy with what I saw. Yes, the images were good, technically, but they lacked something special, that quality that I experienced when I went through a monograph of one of my favorite photographers like Brisson, Winogrand, Allard, Abel, and and others. I wasn't even close. I eventually had the revelation that the one thing that I was doing, or more accurately not doing, was paying attention to the light. That moment that I began to observe the light was, was transformative for me, and it made a huge difference. But there was another thing I had to learn. I had to take risks. I had to walk into that space of discomfort. I had to venture into territory where I didn't know how the pictures would turn out, where I might face much more failure than success. I had to risk making pictures that might make me look like a bad photographer. And that was liberating because I was journeying into the unfamiliar, a place where I couldn't rely on old tropes and techniques to provide me an acceptable result. I needed to embrace the possibility that I might completely fall on my face. And the truth is, I often did. However, the good thing was, I saw my photography begin to change. Eventually, I not only started to make better photographs, but I started making different photographs. I made photographs that I would never have considered before. And best of all, I began surprising myself. I recognized that this discomfort, when I was willing to walk through it, was an indication that there was something waiting for me over the threshold, but only if I was willing to cross it. More often than not, 
Those things meant good things, not only for my photography, but also my life. I still experience discomfort, and that desire to avoid it is still there, and it sometimes seduces me back into its comfortable, familiar arms. Yet when I shake it off and take my camera and journey into unfamiliar and uncomfortable territory, I feel emboldened in a way that is both inspiring and invigorating. If I want something new in my photographs, I have to be willing to do something new, to do something different. And even if such experiences mean a lot of failure, I just remember that I'll still be okay. Because the next day, I'll take my camera, walk out the door, and do it all over again. And on a good day, I'll make the choice to be comfortable with my discomfort. And if the photo gods are kind, I'll make a picture that is better than I could have imagined or hoped for. And that will make it all worth it. And that's the last frame. Thanks to Anne Rong for sharing his time and story with us. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting anrongzoo.com. I will be in Washington, D.C. in May for the Focus on the Story Photographic Conference. The International Photo Festival will feature some of the world's best photojournalists and documentary photographers, as well as talks, photo walks, and workshops, of which I am teaching one. If you want to sign up for my workshop or just want to find out more about the event, visit focusonthestory.org. And remember to check out my YouTube channel where I discuss different aspects of photography by pulling images from listeners just like you who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr pool. You can check out the TCF Flickr pool and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My new book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. In it, I translate how to see and use light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture to make great photographs. It's more than how to make a good picture, but how you can develop a personal and intimate way of seeing and documenting the world around you. You can order the book today. And when you place your order from the Rocky Nook website, use the promo code Corello40 to receive 40% off the list price. Check out the website and the show notes for the link. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frame, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. And if you like what you're hearing on the show, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store as it helps our ranking and creates greater awareness of the show. Thanks to Denzel Dean from New Zealand and Phil Rizzi 7 for their five-star reviews. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or if you just want to make a one-time contribution, you can do that via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to T. Richard, Timothy Hardy, Cerise Longbottom, great name by the way, Remus McNeff, and Rick Albertson for their recent and generous contributions. I so appreciate it. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download The Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. Download it today. You'll find it where everything else is, in the show notes or the website, at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at Ivarianx. And this is Ivarianx, and this is The Candid Frame.